so many of the Elohim were warfaring beings. And when we look at the Sky Council or the El Ba'adat, the Council of Powers in the Hebrew Scriptures, we find that a lot of the time what they're doing is fomenting war. Yahweh is not very different to the other Elohim in liking war and going to war, using it for his own purposes, and thinking that a divided and warring humanity is not a bad thing. I translate it for the most important uh, publishing, Catholic publishing house in Italy, uh, which uh, works uh, under the Vatican. I translated 17 books. These books are in the university, in the Faculty of Theology. And these books translate literally what the Bible says. Made for the scholars have the right translation because the scholars know the Hebrew and so they know what is plural and what is singular. In the Bible for the family, many verbs that in Hebrew are in the plural form are translated in a singular form. And this is a mistake, is a mistranslation, is an inconsistency. It's false, it's false. Welcome to the Fifth Kind TV. Ciao Mauro, it's wonderful to have you back. Ciao Paul, and uh, first of all, thank you for having me in your podcast. And uh, oh, thank you to our audience. Definitely. I really enjoyed the series that we recorded on some of the key words uh, in the Bible. It's been amazingly popular around the world. And uh, in the time since that series, we've both been busy. Would you like to say something about what you've been doing in recent months? Now I have uh, just published my last book, Gods of the Bible. And uh, I am uh, working with uh, uh, Eric von Deniken uh, in order to, to write an another, uh, another book that uh, will be published the, uh, the next year. Oh, that's very exciting. But, I'm but, looking uh, forward to that. A great uh, collaboration. Uh, oh. Okay, thank you. First of all, I want to apologize with uh, our audience because my English is very, very basic. And uh, so I hope to be able to make me understood from the audience. No worries. We will go slowly and clearly. But we're meeting today because the series that we did together produced a lot of questions from our audience. And uh, Tony is going to uh, forward some questions to us that have been asked in recent months, and we will try to answer them. Yes, we, we can try to answer to some of them, uh, or some of uh, these uh, questions. And uh, so we can go. Wonderful. So Tony, what do you have for us? Hi, Paul and Moro. Really love your work. I'm writing a book called Viking Superpowers, and I just wanted to ask you two connected questions. The ancient Viking sagas say that their gods, who are called the Aesir, Odin, Thor, Freya, Loki, etc., were actually mortal superhumans who took on the names of previous gods that people believed in, and that they seeded the, the peoples of the North with their genetics. The sagas also state that they originally came from Central Asia uh, and the Middle East, that they had a massive high-tech city there called Aosgard, which means Asgard in normal English. 
What I wanted to ask you is, could they have been Elohim who were assigned to rule the north of the world, the north of Europe and Scandinavia? And the second related question is, um, could you tell me who you think the Magi were? Um, I know the Bible stories, of course, and about the star. I'd like you to just tell me what you think about who the Magi were, and is there any possibility they could have been connected to such a amazing people living in um, Central Asia, around Troy and that area? Thanks very much. Which means, thank you kindly, wise gentlemen. Well, thank you, David, for that question. David Lovegrove has a wonderful channel that he's building up, Viking Superpowers. Mauro, would you like to uh, go first on those questions? Oh, yes. I, um, I think I can uh, answer to the first part of this, of this uh, question uh, about the Northern Elohim. I think it is possible that uh, in the North Europe went the, the Elohim that are named, of course, in uh, uh, local language, language, but uh, I have in um, mind an account that is in Josephus Flavius, a Jewish historian, and also in uh, Tacitus, uh, Roman historian, uh, they uh, wrote in their books, and uh, Josephus Flavius wrote in um, Jewish wars, that in the 70 after, after Christ, when the Romans went to Jerusalem, in the sky of Jerusalem, there were ma many flying machines, and they and the, the inhabitants of J Jerusalem heard a voice saying, "The gods are leaving this place." So it is possible, in my opinion, of course, that the gods lived that place and went to the north of Europe and in effect in the north of Europe we try many um, names that are the same uh, that we can we can uh, find in the in the Bible and so uh, I think uh, we could say there is a um, relation between the Elohim, the, 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 the Elohim of the Bible and the gods of the north of Europe. Thanks, Maro. I I would agree with that. I think the scenario that's described in the Bible, I'm thinking about uh, uh, Deuteronomy 32, Psalm 82, is one where planet Earth has been invaded by a, a foreign power who is now carving up territory. And so different areas of land, different regions are given to different Elohim and Yahweh is one of those Elohim, they each get a portion of land. And so you've got, you know, El of the Philistines, the powerful one of the Philistines, El of Egypt, Akek, you've got Chemosh, Dagon, El of Ekron, the Prince of Persia. And the picture emerges is of a, a landmass that's been carved up into territory and each one has its own Elohim. Now, that kind of scenario uh, mirrors what we hear in other mythologies around the world. An interesting note in the biblical version of it is that Yahweh, for instance, is given a people group 
without land. And so then he has to go to war against the other powerful ones to get land. And there are a lot of stories uh, in the biblical canon that are really about these powerful beings warring with each other for land, people, resources, power. And those kind of wars echo when we listen to the stories of the kings, for instance, with their flying cities in the Vedas and echoes around the world. So I think it's very possible that what we have is a memory of a time when the whole of planet Earth operated that way. And you might have had quite separate and different powerful beings in different parts of the planet. But having said that, the fact that they are competing for territory then raises the possibility that some are going to be pushed out of their preferred places. And just as we have migrations of human demographics throughout history, you may well have migrations of Elohim or migrations of Anunnaki or Aesir or whatever the name is that we choose. So the powerful beings that start off in the Levant might very well end up in the Nordic countries. So I think it's the same scenario that's being described and it's possible there's a migration of some of the same entities in that period of our deep history. Oh yes, there, there may be, there has been a change of power in many areas of, of, the, of the earth and the Elohim move from, uh, moved from one part to the other according to the order descending by the ire of the Elohim, Elion. Yes, that's right, El Elion, that's right. He's the one who, who parcels the lands out. So I think that's possible. The second question, the one about the Magi, is just really intriguing because it relates to the story uh, in the Gospels when visitors come And there's an ambiguity in the text as to where they come from, if they've come from the east or if they've traveled east uh, to come and see the young Jesus. But what's intriguing about it is that these are not Jewish people. They're not Hebrew people looking for a Messiah. They are people from a different part of the world who are looking for an enlightened teacher who has just been born. And so that rather more fits with the thought forms that you can find in the East, such as people looking for a new bodhisattva. Um, and I wonder if it is something like that. I like the story because it, it internationalizes the gospel from the beginning. And of course, by the time you're into the New Testament, you realize it is an international faith and an international teaching that has been shared by Jesus, the Jesus figure. It's not just a Jewish story. So that's how I would read that. Okay. I haven't so, anything to add. Tony, do we have another question to move on to? Yeah. Hi, this is Paul Bruce. And what I want to know is Yahweh one of the Elohim, because I know Elion was the most high Elohim. But what I want to know is, is Yahweh one of the Elohim? And will he soon be kicked out of the heavenly council because all of the calamity that he is causing on the planet with all the wars that go on between Israel and um the Palestinian people, because we know what's taking place over there. But that's what I want to know. Thank you. So I'll just repeat that question. Was Yahweh one of the Elohim? Uh, was he kicked out of the council because of his warfaring tendencies? Um Is he a present reality or, or does he just belong in history? What are your thoughts, Marlo? 
But uh, <coughs> Yahweh was only one of the Elohim, and uh, uh, what we have to know is uh, um, the fact the fact that to Yahweh was assigned only one group of Hebrew, not all the Hebrew people because to Yahweh was assigned only the family of Jacob. So Yahweh, uh, in order to conquer uh, um, a land to, to, um, to rule over, had the need to, to fight uh, against other Elohim. And I think uh, this is possible possi um, possible that is continuing Be because in that land uh, the the war the wars continued uh, and since two thousand uh, two thousand years and uh, uh, and uh, Yahweh. So is not a universal Elohim and is not the Elohim of all the Hebrew. Because in the Bible, we read literally that he uh, was fighting also against other families of Hebrew. I won't say more, he was fighting against other families of the same family of Abram, like Moabites, Ammonites, and so on. So uh, we um, can look at what is now uh, happening in um, Palestine as uh, uh, one of the many wars that uh, uh, were fought in uh, that land. Yes, I think that's right. Um, we mentioned the scenario earlier where the Elohim are being uh, apportioned land and people groups, and the land is being portioned by an entity referred to as El Elyon, the powerful one higher than the other powerful ones. And Yahweh is one of the Elohim. He seems to be one of the junior ones because he gets a raw deal. He gets a people group with no land. And as Mauro has just pointed out, he doesn't get all the descendants of Abraham. He gets the tribes of Jacob, the tribes of Israel. And as we mentioned before, it creates a big problem because you have a people group with no land, with no citizenship. And whenever that happens in the world, it is a problem and it is an injustice. And so some of the stories we read are of uh, Yahweh going to war because he wants justice for himself and for his people group. And, well, there are a number of people groups you can think of around the world who are in that position today. They don't, they're stateless, they don't have citizenship, they don't have equal rights, something that is um, a human rights issue around the world. We might think of the Rohingya people, and we certainly might think of Palestinians today, and we would think of the tribes of Israel in the past. And I think that some of these ancient stories really give us a lens by which to understand things happening in the world today. And being stateless is a massive problem. It's a problem of injustice. I think uh, the other part of Paul's question about Yahweh being kicked out for, for warfaring, I don't think so, because so many of the Elohim uh, were warfaring beings. And when we look at the Sky Council or the El Ba'adat, the Council of Powers in the Hebrew Scriptures, 
we find that a lot of the time what they're doing is fomenting war. In 1 Kings 22, the seer, Micaiah, remote views the Sky Council, and what he sees them doing is fomenting war. And there's a being on the council who says, I think I can trick this nation into invading this other nation on the basis of false intelligence. And the council all think this is a wonderful idea. So Yahweh is not very different to the other Elohim in liking war and going to war, using it for his own purposes, and thinking that a divided and warring humanity is not a bad thing. And again, I think we're told these stories uh, to help us understand why the world works as it does. And very often we have wars that are presented to us as international conflicts, conflicts between nations. But if we look and listen carefully, we discover they are not international conflicts. They are conflicts among the powers who govern. And it's about which power has which people group and which land and which resources. And uh, a famous illustration of this, to make it less controversial, uh, we could take from the First World War. And it was approaching the first Christmas of the First World War, and the working class boys from Germany decided they didn't want to kill the working class boys from Britain. At Christmas. They wanted to do something else at Christmas. And they started singing Christmas carols. And then they came out of the trenches and they met in no man's land. And they played soccer together. And they exchanged gifts. Because the working class boys of Germany and the working class boys of Britain had no argument with each other. The argument was among the powers among the rulers, the royal families, as to who had which territory, who had which people group, and whether they were honouring treaties that they'd previously made. Even there, you could see it wasn't truly a conflict between nations. Nations were pushed into a conflict among the powers. And I think you can look at conflicts in the world today, you'll find the same situation. You ask men, women, and children on the street, what their argument is with one another, and they will say, it's not us, it's our government. It's not us, it's those who act for us. That's where the conflict is. And so I think our ancestors tried to prepare us to understand uh, the real politique of why things work the way they do in the world today. Oh, I agree absolutely with Paul when he says that Yahweh wasn't different from the other Elohim. And uh, uh, Yahweh uh, acted just like the others in order to conquer nations, areas to, to rule over. Absolutely. Thanks, Paul, for that question. It was a really thoughtful question. Tony, what do you have for us next? Hi, guys. And uh, sorry for the, I hope the quality is fine. I've, I love your work, okay. Um, and I'm really intrigued by uh, Mario Bellino, Biglino. I hope I didn't butcher his name. Uh, regarding the Elohim translations, I remember I've uh, heard uh, Dr. Michael Heiser, who has unfortunately passed away, on his take of Psalm 82, and uh, in his take, he said that it, the, it's translated that Elohim as singular stands in the midst of plural. Elohim. So it looks like Psalm 82 is referring to as the word Elohim as a singular and also as a plural. 
And this is his take on the fact that Elohim can also mean God, like singular God, but also can mean, can mean um, yeah, as you call the powerful ones. What's the real translation of Psalm 82? That would be nice to hear. Okay, God bless you. <clears throat> Wonderful. Well, oh. can I start on this one, Mauro, and then you can tell me if I've got this right. Okay. So uh, Elohim is a very interesting word. And though it is, I think, one of the Bible's earliest words that gets traditionally translated as God, it does not mean what we understand by the word God. It is a masculine plural form word that if we break it down, means the powers or the powerful ones. And when I wrote Escaping from Eden, I wondered why this word Elohim would take plural verb forms and exhibit plural behaviors like uh, having conversations or having conflicts or having wars. And I asked the question, what if it really is a simple plural? How do the stories change if we read it in the plural? And that was the beginning of my journey. But I recognized what Tudor Him says, that the grammar surrounding Elohim is unusual. There are moments when Elohim appears to be used in the singular, with a singular verb form. And so to help me get my head around that, I spoke to Dom Henry Wandsborough, who was the senior editor for the New Jerusalem Bible. And I had a conversation with him, and he suggested to me that the word Elohim could be a word in transition, that essentially it is a plural word, that it does mean the powerful ones. And so it's quite coherent when we see it with plural behaviors, plural verb forms, but it can also be used as a collective so that it can refer to the powerful ones as a group. And so in the way we in English might talk about the nobility or royalty, and it's a singular word, but it refers to a group of people. And when you use a singular word, a collective noun like royalty or nobility, you will often find you get a bit confused when it comes to adding the verb to the sentence. Uh, so it would be correct to say royalty is always getting itself into trouble, except we know royalty refers to a number of people and so usually we would say royalty are always getting themselves into trouble. And so for reasons like that, we can see Elohim used in the singular as a group, used in the plural for a group of people. And I do think there are moments also where it's become familiar to the speakers to use it as a singular noun. And so um, you might say the Elohim of a place and you're only referring to one Elohim. So that's why I say I think it's a word in transition that originally it was a simple plural. Then we see times when it might be a group, a collective noun and moments where it might be used in the singular. It gets even further confused when the redactor sometimes pastes the name Yahweh where the word Elohim used to be and other places where he puts Yahweh and Elohim next to each other. So those are my thoughts. What do you think, Maro? I agree with you because the term Elohim can be used uh, for indicate, um, to indicate a group of powerful ones and uh, only one singular singular individual and uh, uh, that's why elohim is used with uh, verbs in a single singular 
and in a plural form. The friend who posed the questions quoted Michael Eiser, and I remember that Michael Eiser talking about the assembly uh, um, that the Psalm 82 is, is talking um, about. This, uh, this assembly uh, was in the sky and not on the earth. And uh, so uh, I think uh, um, that is important to know that we have the need to have grammar um, rules to follow. But the ancient authors of the Bible didn't have the same need and so they used the verb in a plural or in, in a singular form according to the fact that who uh, was acting was one singular Elohim as Yahweh, for example, or the Elohim as the group. Wonderful. Now, a question that a lot of people have asked me uh, who have watched our series, Mauro, they say they've loved the series and they now realize they want uh, a different Bible translation than the one they have sitting on their bookcase. And they often ask me, is there a translation of the Bible, uh, the Old Testament or the New Testament, that you recommend for getting close to the root meanings of the key words. How would you answer that? But uh, I, I think uh, it's uh, necessary to read a Bible with an um, uh, interlinear translation and literal translation. Because reading uh, what the Bible says literally, we find we, and we understand when the Bible talks about the Elohim as a group and uh, when the Bible talks about Elohim as a singular individual. And uh, there were many verses, many chapters, in which uh, it's possible to understand clearly th this uh, difference. I think uh, it's uh, necessary or it's enough uh, to read the Bible with an open mind without the, the glasses of the, the, the theologian thought, uh, which has, has the necessity to affirm and reaffirm monotheism and so the theologian thought had the necessity to demonstrate that Elohim is always singular but that is not true yes yes oh I absolutely agree with what you said Mauro I I agree. I think really to get to the bottom of things, you have to get an interlinear Bible, an interlinear Bible with the Hebrew for the Hebrew texts, an interlinear with the Greek for the New Testament texts. I like to use an interlinear uh, with the Greek of the Septuagint as well. And if, if I point people to a Bible translation, I often say that personally, I like the New Jerusalem Bible, the expanded study edition, because I find the editorial notes are more honest than a lot of Bibles, and they will point out where there is, where there are questions about what a word might mean. So there are huge questions as to what El Shaddai means, 
and the okay. editorial footnotes will admit to that in the New Jerusalem. Or when we see Elohim being used in the plural, and it seems to be a repeat of Sumerian stories, the editors in the New Jerusalem will admit that. So I, I applaud that. Uh, I'm impressed with that. But I answer the same way that you do, Mano. I say, read an interlinear. They, they can be expensive, but you can find interlinears online. But the key then is to have really good lexicons that you're reading with. So for the, the Hebrew texts, get hold of Brown Drivers Briggs and really read that, what it says about the keywords. Or for the Greek, go to the Bauer, Arndt, Gingrich, and Danker lexicon, and that will get you into the roots of those words too. And it's expensive to get those books, but it's so rewarding because once you start reading those texts in that way and getting to root meanings, it's a great way of peeling back centuries of doctrine and dogma and theology and assumption and getting back to the roots of what the writers were originally saying. Oh, yes, uh, I, uh, in my little <laughs> career, I translated for the most important uh, uh, publishing, Catholic publishing house uh, uh, in Italy, uh, which uh, works uh, under the Vatican. I translated 17 books in an uh, interlinear way and uh, uh, our audience can say what it means. There is a Hebrew test and under we have the literal translation of each, of each word. And uh, this, uh, these books are in the university, in the Faculty of Theology. And these books translate literally what the Bible says. And it's important because often in the Bible for the family, Many verbs that in Hebrew are in the plural form are translated in a singular form. And this is a mistake, is a mistranslation, is an inconsistency. It's false. It's false, I would yes. say. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> because these these uh, these books uh, made for the scholars have the right translation because the scholars know the hebrew and so they know what is plural and what is singular the families don't know hebrew and so the family have to read singular also when in Hebrew we have plural. And I think this is a, a mistranslation. There is, a, I think there is a sort of willingness to, 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 to make the, the the Bible understandable. Yes. Oh, I beg your pardon, but I have a Tourette's syndrome, so I have the need to, uh, while uh, I am speaking to control the movement. <laughs> Sorry, but the syndromes, but the Tourette's syndromes, it's very strong, and uh, I can. I can say anything. <laughs> I I can, I can only to try to control. No worries. Um, I 
love pointing people to your work, Mauro, because uh, your credentials for biblical translation are superb. They, they can't be challenged. They can't be questioned. And I find that it is easy for me to find people in the academic world to acknowledge what you and I are saying, even if they don't want to agree publicly with all our conclusions, they know the validity of what we're saying. But what frustrates me is that though there is that respect at that level, when you go into communities of faith, into churches, what is known by the academics is not known by the millions of people who go to churches and maybe synagogues all around the world. And they will be maintaining the traditional interpretations and traditional translations as if they are defending God by uh, defending those translations, not knowing that the people who train their rabbis and pastors might see things a very different way. And it's one of the things that motivates me in my writing because I think people should know these things. So, for instance, the, the basic fact that so many of the Elohim stories in the Bible are the summary form of the Mesopotamian stories from ancient Sumeria, Babylonia, Arcadia, and Assyria you can find it in the editorial notes in the New Jerusalem Bible. You can find it discussed by academics. But even after um, 150 years of that knowledge being in academia, still most people in the churches don't know anything about it. And I think that's a great shame. Oh, yes. Uh, and... Uh... What uh, is uh, important uh, is, uh, in my opinion, uh, to say that many people believe to a book, believe to that translation of a book, and, and uh, they don't know that the, that the translations are um, not right. No, that's right. They feel they have to defend the translation that they have. Tony, do you have another question for us? Why are there no female Elohim? They mate with human females. Are there no female Elohim? Are they a cloned species? Is that why they made Eve? Thank you, Will Cole. Mauro, how would you answer that? Okay, but uh, I think uh, first of all that in the Bible the uh, are named um, almost one female of the Elohim, Asherah, and we know that in many archaeological sites the um, archaeologian found inscriptions with the name of Asherah, who is indicated as the mate of Yahweh. In the Elephantina Island on the Nile River, there were a Hebrew community that knew the Asherah of Yahweh, and she was called um, Anat Yahu. But uh, if we read the laws, the myths of uh, the nations all around the world, as, as uh, Paul do, and uh, Paul speaks uh, often about uh, other nations, we find that uh, there were Elohim 
female or if we prefer so to say there were female deities if we read the, the text of hinduism if we read the text of the greek of greeks of the romans of the egyptians of uh, the sumerians of the assyrians of babylonians we find uh, the presence of uh, female uh, deities but the bible was uh, written by a, a priest who uh, cancelled the present the presence of a female and left only the masculine the the male yahweh but there were absolutely uh, female uh, into this uh, divinity into this uh, power ones and eve was made only for adam not for the elohim but is uh, this is another question yes it really is intriguing because the bible the hebrew scriptures are very male dominated as we have them today and i think they contrast to an extent with other narrative traditions if you go to the what i believe are the source narratives of the Bible story of beginnings, you will go to the ancient Sumerian and Babylonian stories. And there you will hear about female sky people. You'll hear about Shamhat and Nama and Ninhursag. And you get to the Bible and you really just find Asherah named. Now, it may be that there are other female Elohim in the uh, Seva Hashemayim who are not named. They are just among the other Elohim. But I think that when we get to Jeremiah, for instance, the prophet Jeremiah, and he talks about how the, um, the tribes of Israel remembered Asherah positively and they remembered Yahweh negatively, what we may be looking at is the two poles, the two opposites of their ancient contact experiences, because Asherah was an experience of nurture. It's their version of the story of Hunhunapu or Umbab Mwana Wariso or Shamhat, the female figure who comes to nurture and help humans become a sophisticated civilized force on the planet who introduces them to agriculture and medicine who makes their land fertile who helps their people to be fertile and asherah is remembered with thanks and so jeremiah laments the fact that on every high hill and under every green tree from every fortified city to every garrison town asherah is commemorated and he laments the fact that the people have rejected the laws of Yahweh and they speak very negatively about what it was like to be ruled by him. I think what Jeremiah is describing there is really a summary form where he's just named two of the Elohim when we know there were many. He's mentioned one male and one female, whereas I think there were many males and many females are that every individual Elohim named, whether it's El of Ekron, El of the Philistines, Achech, Shemosh, Dagon, probably represented a community of beings, and we're being told about the leader. History is often written that way. We're told about the leader, and we just have to assume his retinue and his team and all his support stuff. So I think even in the Bible, I think there are female Elohim there, even if they're not named. When we go to the Sumerian sources, they are named. And then when we go to other traditions that weren't reformed in the way that Judaism was, 
we find the females there. But when the final redaction happened with the Old Testament, the agenda really was to magnify Yahweh and to forget about everyone else. And the only ones who were named are the ones whose memory was so strong they couldn't airbrush them out. They couldn't make people forget them. And so they are acknowledged, but they're represented as um, figures, of idol figures of idolatry. And so I think within the redaction of the Bible, there's been a deliberate forgetting. And the fact that we still have one female figure, a very powerful Elohim Asherah, is just um, the tip of the iceberg the memory that there were males and females and a spectrum of beings encountered in the past. If, if uh, I'm not wrong, I remember that uh, the same Solomon made a place to worship uh, Asherah. And, yes, uh, he did. He did it. What, what, Paul? Yes, he did. Within the Jerusalem temple, Solomon had commissioned artworks to commemorate the range of Elohim, and at a land they were defaced at the time of King Hezekiah, and he had constructed an entire temple to Asherah and employed an entire priesthood in Jerusalem to honor Asherah. And that was just one of many temples throughout Judea, throughout the Levant, to honor these other beings. And so when the redactor has to retell the story, he has to explain why the wisest king of all, Solomon, would have temples and priests honoring Asherah and Chemosh and other beings. And so the story that the redactor comes up with is, it was his foreign wives. That was the problem. And if he'd only married good Jewish wives, that would never have happened. But that's what they said as a way of coping with the fact that everybody knew Solomon had uh, encouraged the worship or commemoration of Asherah. Okay. So, Tony, uh, I see a question here about the Garden of Eden. So I'll, I'll just read it from the screen. Uh, can you tell us about the Garden of Eden and what your interpretation is of that episode in the Bible? What about Adam and Eve and the tree? Uh, and there were two trees. Uh, what do you think about this? And what can you say about the mistranslation of the apple? Oh, <clears throat> uh, with, uh, I start with the apple. In the Bible, there is not uh, the apple. The Bible talks about a fruit. When the Bible was uh, uh, translated in Latin, the tree of knowledge of good and evil became in Latin the tree of bonum and malum. But uh, the term malum means both evil, but also the tree of the apple. And from that moment in the Bible and in the tradition where in, uh, was introduced the concept of the apple, of the apple, the apple tree, but the apple is not present in the, in the Bible. The question of, of the two trees of the, um, the Bible is intriguing and is curious because uh, 
it seems that in the Bible there is an inconsistency because the Bible says that the tree of the life is, was planted in the center of the garden and the Bible don't say where uh, was planted the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But when Eve eat the fruit, the Bible says that uh, Eve ate the fruit of the tree that was in the center of the garden. But uh, um, after the traditions, the tradition tells us that Eve ate the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. So we have a contradiction. And uh, we uh, are allowed to, to think, but it's only a suggestion, of course, that in origin there was only one tree which was divided during the centuries. It's interesting to see how these two trees make their appearance in other stories. So thinking about the, the apple, the story in which it appears is a story in which human beings are upgraded. Before they eat this fruit, they are so unintelligent, they don't even know they're naked. And the concern of the powerful ones doing the upgrade or, or discussing the upgrade is that if they are upgraded, they will become too similar to the Elohim. So this is a massive upgrade from being at an animal level to being at the level of the powerful ones, an advanced technological species. So this is a huge upgrade they're discussing. And on one side of the argument uh, is a being saying they should be upgraded, they need a happier experience. And on the other side, a being saying, no, I want to keep them so unintelligent they don't even know they're naked. And the strange thing in the Bible's version of that story is that it is the Yahweh character, the God character, who is against human progress. Nevertheless, uh, the other one breaks ranks and achieves the upgrade. And that story echoes what is in the Sumerian narratives, and it echoes in other narratives from all around the world. You can find it in African story, you can find it in Mesoamerican story. And the upgrade is achieved through this food. Now, I just find it very intriguing. Uh, this is not proof of anything, it's just intriguing that there are paleoanthropologists today who argue that Homo sapiens achieved a great leap forward in intelligence by ingesting foods with psychedelic properties. So that is a mainstream idea today, that at some point in our development, our ancestors ate a certain kind of mushroom or a certain kind of fermented drink and our imaginations were activated in a way that hadn't happened before. All of a sudden, we could imagine a different reality. And so our curiosity could then become experimentation, exploration, progress, technology. So this is a mainstream view that food may have taken this key role in our evolution. It's there in the Sumerian story as well, because when Shamhat wants to upgrade the primitive Enkidu, she does it by introducing him to more sophisticated foods and to fermented drinks. So I wonder if buried in the story of the apple or the fruit 
is the recollection of a time when our ancestors were upgraded through the introduction of different foods and different substances to activate and develop our brains. So this is, I'm just speculating. Uh, there's nothing I can prove. I just think it's an interesting correlation. And then the, the tree of life uh, uh, makes two other appearances in the Bible, one in the Hebrew scriptures, one in the New Testament. That's in the book of Ezekiel and in the book of Revelation. And there, what we are told is about the use of leaves as um, sources of healing. So in Ezekiel, we have this place that's described, and Ezekiel calls it a temple. And it doesn't seem like any temple he'd seen before because it's got artificial light in it. And then he says there are plants in one section of the temple, and the leaves of those plants are used to heal people. Well, we still use leaves of plants to heal people today. I mean, that's what aspirin is. So that gets my attention. And the same connection is made in Revelation, that the, the leaves give us perpetual health, uh, perpetual life. So this idea of healing botanicals is a very persistent one in the Bible, and it's there in other traditions as well. And again, I wonder if it's just a way of telling the story of a memory. So we have a memory of being upgraded through foods, fermented drinks, and then a memory of essentially medications being introduced that are produced from plants. And that's part of indigenous knowledge the world over. That's what medicine has always been. Things we've derived from the environment, from the botanical environment to improve our health. So I think I try not to read the stories in too fundamentalist a way. I, I try and ask the question, what is the memory that these stories are curating? And those are my speculations on those subjects. Oh, yes. Uh, and uh, I uh, say always uh, that uh, if uh, we pretend that the Bible tells us a true history, we uh, become able to understand uh, many things. For example, uh, what you now said about the tree, about the fermented food, the fermented drink, and so and so on. And uh, in all the, the histories, like Sumerian, for example, we read they um, like uh, drink, uh, ferment drink. And uh, also that uh, often they were drunk. And uh, so, uh, I think uh, this is uh, the reason why the Elohim uh, thought was dangerous if uh, uh, the Adamites uh, um, ate uh, the fruit of the of the of the of this uh, tree, because this tree had to be under control only of the Elohim. Yes, I also make a connection with Plato here, because Plato was an enthusiast for fermented drink as well. And when he presents his information, he goes to three main sources for authoritative information. He applies logic to things that we can all observe. We could call that science. He goes to ancestral narratives, as I do in, in my writing. But then he also appeals to information derived through altered states of consciousness. And so the reference is made to the cult of Orpheus, the cult of Hecate, and the Eleusinian mysteries, which all used fermented drink to, to, as a way of unlocking higher cognitive powers. 
And so for Plato, the story of fermented foods and fermented drinks wasn't just about the past, how our ancestors became cleverer. He believed it was something we could use in the present to make ourselves cleverer. But it, in the context of carefully curated ceremonies, not simply by drinking too much on a Friday night. I'm going to go to the next question that we've got on the board here. Um, Hello, Paul and Mauro. After all the Elohim mentions, do you anywhere in the Old Testament find a real creator God? Yeah. Can you repeat, please? Yes. The question is, is the idea of a transcendent God or a creator God anywhere in the Old Testament, or ha have we misunderstood it? But uh, uh, I, um, I think uh, that uh, the Bible doesn't speak about a creator God. The Bible doesn't speak about a, uni a universal God, but uh, as uh, um, is uh, written in many Hebrew commentaries written by rabbis, the Bible tells us the story of the creation of the people of Israel. But uh, I want to add, uh, to confirm that, I want to add that the, the verb bara, which is always translated as to create, with to create, doesn't mean create, but means to intervene in a pre-existent situation in order to change it. So uh, I think that the concept of a God, uh, of a universal and a transcendental God who created the universe is not present in the Bible. But I want to say a thing. I don't say that God doesn't, non, doesn't exist. I don't say. It's uh, uh, not my concern. I don't want to discuss the existence of, the, of, uh, of God. I only want to say that that book doesn't speak ab about that God. After that, God could absolutely exist, but I don't know, and overall, I don't want to speak because my concern, my uh, um, uh, work, my uh, area uh, of interest is a book, only a book, the Old Testament in particular, and the Old Testament doesn't speak about a universal creation. And uh, so I, I hope to, to, to be clear, because I'm not an atheist, uh, absolutely. I, uh, and I have a mind open to all solutions, but I uh, have, uh, so to say, the certainty that when the Bible talks about the Elohim, doesn't talk about the universal God. I love how you answered that, Mauro, with such clarity. I agree with what you're saying. I return to what you said about uh, the word bara, that it does not mean to create. Um, if you are doing that, you are fashioning something that's already there. And that is reflected in the Genesis story itself. Because what we think of as the creation story in Genesis 1 
if you read it closely, it is not a creation story. All the things described are described from the vantage of a planet that already exists and has been flooded and has been devastated, is in a state uh, of tohu wa bohu, which means it's been um, pushed into a state of chaos and it needs rehabilitating. And when we read the Genesis 1 story, it is a story of rehabilitation, the clearing of a darkened atmosphere, the separation of the waters, salt water from fresh water, the rehabilitation of the land, and all those steps of recovery, well, they are exactly what you would do on a planet that's been devastated by a cataclysm, but all those steps of recovery you can find in other narrative traditions. So the source narratives of Sumeria begin with the separation of the waters by the four winds. In Genesis, it is the wind, the ruach, which hovers over the flood waters and begins the work of terraforming. In the Filipino story, it is the hawk, the tagalog, creating vortices of wind to drive back the flood waters and create islands. In the Yoruba and Edo story from Nigeria and Cameroon, it is Osanabua, the powerful one above the waters, clearing the waters away to rehabilitate the land. The, the further you travel around the world, the more convinced you will be that our so-called creation stories are all stories of recovery, rehabilitation of a planet that has been devastated by a cataclysm. Go to the Mayan story in the Popol Vuh. The feathered serpents, the progenitors, arrive in a dark sky over floodwaters and start discussing how to re-nurture life on earth. I find it interesting that that's where our stories begin, not with creation, not with the beginning of the cosmos, not with the formation of the planet, but rather powerful beings arriving and working with what was here. And that is reflected in the, in the word bara, as Maro said earlier. Yes, if, if uh, it's possible, I would add that the term Bereshit probably uh, doesn't mean Bereshit, uh, i.e. the origin of all the universe, but Bereshit, Reshit, is the origin of that history, that is the history of people of the history of the intervention of the Elohim on the earth in order to transform the earth in a place useful for them and the history of the creation of the fabrication um, of the people of Israel. Yes, that makes sense to me. I would also observe that in the first 11, I should say perhaps 12, maybe up to 19 chapters of Genesis, what we have are a whole sequence of stories of beginnings. So we've got the, the beginning story we were just discussing in Genesis 1. We've got another beginning story in Genesis 2. We've got another beginning story in Genesis 3. How did we become homo sapiens as we know ourselves to be? We've got another beginning story in Genesis 6 where there is a catastrophe and then a rebooting of human life. And then we've got the end of a civilization in Genesis 3 and the beginning of the stories of the people of Abraham uh, in Genesis 12. And because of parallels between the stories of Abraham and Sarah and Brahma and Saraswati of the Vedas, 
because of some of the things that follow, I actually think there's a story of human origins layered into the story of Abraham as well. So I think when we've got a word that means beginnings and then a whole sequence of stories of beginnings, we're really being told how to read those early chapters of Genesis. Okay. Now we have another question, uh, which I will appear at, uh, appeared on the board here. Um, uh, let's see. I have an earlier question, actually. Somebody here asking you, Mauro, if you can tell us a little something about your book, The Gods of the Bible, and what is it that you explore in that book? Okay. In, in uh, this book, I explore some of the topics of my work. In particular, I think it's better to read uh, the index so we can understand easily. I talk about Elohim. I talk about Ruach, which is always translated as a spirit, but doesn't mean spirit. I talk about the Adam. I uh, talk about the fall of humankind, the, uh, about the so-called original sin. I talk of the time when the men were going back and forth with the Elohim. And I talk about Enoch, and Noah in particular. I dedicated a chapter to the giants, another chapter to the birth of monotheism. Uh, Paul has just talked uh, about uh, the, the, the fermented drink and I dedicated a chapter to drug of the gods. Another chapter is dedicated to messengers of God, i.e. the so-called uh, um, angels, the Malachim in the Bible. I talk about uh, Satan. I talk about Cherubim. And uh, I uh, finish with a, a, a chapter that uh, reassume uh, all the all the arguments. Wonderful. I think your book, Gods of the Bible, Mara, goes really well alongside my book, The Eden Conspiracy. There's some overlap because I look at Elohim, Bene Elohim, El Elyon, El Shaddai, Yahweh, uh, Ruach, Kavod. Um, so there's some overlap there, but where I spend a lot of attention in the Eden Conspiracy is showing that the primitive form of Judaism was full of memories of paleo contact. And that when King Hezekiah came along, he wanted to blot out that old memory. He wanted to blot out the memory of the Tseva Hashemayim, the Sky Armies. He wanted to blot out the memory of the Elba Adat, the Council of Powers, and morph Judaism into monotheistic Yahwism. And the Bible itself tells that story from King Hezekiah to the high priest Hilkiah, the royal scribe Shaphan, uh, Hezekiah's grandson, King Josiah, the senior priest Ezra. You follow that storyline, and the Bible tells us how the narrative changed, how the narrative changed from paleo contact 
to monotheism. And so I really make the case from the Bible itself, not only for paleo contact, but for how the narrative was altered. So um, I, I love how these books go together. I love how our work complements each other. I've really enjoyed our collaboration thus far on the series we put together. Thank you, Maro, for reading my first two in the series. And, and your books are very, very, very interesting. And I you. think it's important to have uh, a double check um, um, bet between two, two points of view. Yes. And uh, over the same topic. And in my book, in order to allow the reader to control what I say, I report, I indicate the Hebrew and the literal translation under the passes I, I talk about. That's superb. How can people keep up with what you're doing, Mauro? Where can you send people to so that they can continue to follow your work? Oh, the people can uh, uh, follow me on my channel, Mauro Bellino official channel. <laughs> I forgot. And and in internet maurobellino.com because uh, because uh, in my channel I every week put uh, a video and uh, I enjoy it to, to I enjoyed it to make many uh, video with you and I hope and I hope we can continue to work uh, together in future, of course, uh, making a video about uh, specific topics uh, that uh, people don't don't know, don't know. Definitely. Well, I'm really looking forward to future collaborations as well. If ever you need a chapter from me, then I'm absolutely at your service. Uh, we will put the links to your site and your channel uh, in the description here so that people can go to them and follow you. And people know my links, fifthkind.tv, paulanthonywallace.com. We'll pause at this point, but I've really enjoyed this conversation and I will be looking forward to our next connection. Thank you. Thank you to, all, to, to you. Thank you to our... Uh, Director Tony, uh, thank you all the listeners. Listeners, uh, thank you to our audience. And Thanks, see Mauro. you soon. See you soon. It's been a pleasure. The final edit of the Old Testament of the Bible, the Hebrew canon included the layering of some beautiful and profound theology over the top of ancient texts. Unfortunately, mistranslating traumatic ancestral memories as if they were encounters with God is a choice with far-reaching consequences. Belief in a violent, xenophobic, hierarchical God has been used through the ages to justify violent wars and all manner of abuses. However, the fidelity which the ancient manuscripts have been curated in the Hebrew canon by countless generations of priests and scribes means that in our generation we can now return to these fascinating artifacts of our prehistory and ask how differently they might be translated. To find out more about Paul Wallace and Mauro Bellino, along with links to their published works, follow the links in the video description.